Welcome, everyone, to this sad and special service. We gather today to honor the life and love of Harold Holm, a man with whom each of us had a unique relationship. We gather today to honor those qualities he made evident by his living, those gifts of himself he so readily shared. They made and will continue to make an impression on us, perhaps on none more so than his family, some of whom traveled a great distance to be present today. His daughter, Vibeka, and her partner, Jeff, are here from California. Harold's eldest nephew, Olav, is here from Norway. And his youngest nephew, Henrik, born in Norway and now from Michigan, is here as well. Welcome, all of you. We hope our shared love of Harold will provide you with some comfort. And now let us open the service with Mary Oliver's poem, The Pine Woods. Just before dawn, three deer came walking down the hill, as if the moment were nothing different from eternity. As lightly as that, they nibbled the leaves, they drank from the pond, their pretty mouths sucked the loose silver, their heavy eyes shining. Listen, I did not really see them. I came later and saw their tracks. But I don't believe only to the edge of what my eyes actually see in the kindness of morning. Do you? And my life, which is my body, surely is also something more. Isn't yours? I suppose the deer waited to see the sun lift itself up, filling the hills with light and shadows. They were leaping back into the rough, uncharted pine woods where I have lived so much of my life, where everything is so quick and uncertain, so glancing. So improbable, so real.
Let us pray. In the words of the Ute Nation, in a way Harold might have prayed when he needed to find strength and wisdom. Earth, teach me stillness as the grasses are stilled with light. Earth, teach me caring as parents who secure their young. Earth, teach me courage as the tree which stands all alone. Earth, teach me limitation as the ant which crawls on the ground. Earth, teach me freedom as the eagle which soars in the sky. Earth, teach me resignation as the leaves which die in the fall. Earth, teach me regeneration as the seed which rises in the spring. Earth, teach me to forget myself as melted snow forgets its life. Earth, teach me to remember kindness as dry fields weep with rain. I bring a poem for Harald from the great Norwegian poet Olav Hauge, a poem I think Harald would like and appreciate. It's the dream. It's the dream we carry in secret that something miraculous will happen, that it must happen, that time will open, that the heart will open, that doors will open, that the rock face will open, that spring will gush, that the dream will open, that one morning we will glide into some harbor we didn't know was there. I first met Harald 14 years ago when I was the ministerial candidate at All Souls Church. It was clear to me that Harald, the Norwegian, did not mind having a Swedish minister. Actually, he welcomed it with open arms. Here on neutral ground in the United States, being a fellow Scandinavian meant we shared a strong bond. I think that is what Harald really valued. His new minister understood the emotional challenges and realities of what it means to leave home and family behind, to make a new life in a new land far, far away. He valued having a Swede close by who got that quirky, dry sense of humor and the psyche so typical of Nordic folk, the psyche that demands a stoic response to emotional pain. Even though I was a fellow Scandinavian who understood the stoicism that goes so deep in the Nordic psyche, when I arrived at All Souls in the fall of 2002, I did not know the depth of Harald's grieving. His wife Martha had died in December 2000. Harald cared for her as her Parkinson's disease slowly claimed her life. Meanwhile, Harald was going through treatment for colon cancer, and a month before Martha died, he had to go in for surgery. Yes, he was a cancer survivor, which he was very proud of, but the treatment, the surgery, and losing his beloved wife took a big toll on him. It wasn't until after the crash that I began to realize Harald needed help. The crash came in 2004 when he lost his house because he had not been able to manage. Even though he had lost just about everything, I think the crash provided a kind of miracle, a new beginning. You see, Harald began to slowly open up. He came out of that deep, deep grief and began to rebuild his life. Later, when he suffered a number of strokes that left him with diminished physical abilities, 
He thrived on finding new ways to function and manage all the tasks of daily life. And he was able to live independently. Though his life was again filled with meaning and purpose, he missed Martha deeply. She was the love of his life. Martha was born in this country, but she was very much a Scandinavian spirit. And how could it be otherwise with parents who were both from Finland? I end now with a poem by Eino Leino, one of the pioneers of Finnish poetry. Peace. What is that fragrance around me? What is this quietness? What is this knowledge of peace in my heart? What strange, great, new thing is this? I can hear the flowers growing and the talk of the trees in the wood. I think all my old dreams are ripening all the hopes and the wishes I sowed. Everything's quiet around me. Everything's gentle and sweet. Great flowers are opening up in my heart with a fragrance of deepest peace. Good afternoon. My perception of Harold <clears throat> is uh, partly what I know and cannot prove, and partly what I know. I believe that Harold <clears throat> is part of an ancient race of beings um, written about in the historical novels of J.R.R. Tolkien, variously called Horns or Ents. Uh, these beings are shepherds of and protectors of trees, and they gradually become trees. They can move. You want to have them on your side. <laughs> I don't know this. I have a sneaking suspicion that members of Harold's family might recognize something in Harold that fits with that. My other perceptions are much more mundane. We sang together in various groups for uh, close to 30 years. Harold was a bass. <laughs> I'm a bass. He could go farther down than I can. <laughs> that is so annoying. <laughs> Not only that, he would notice when I was on the wrong note. <laughs> and he would point to the note and say, I said, what? And he would be right. I mean, that is just so annoying. <laughs> he could hit the notes more accurately. He was also a teacher. And during the last years, he taught me a course in how to die.
You do it slowly, piece by piece. You do it lovingly. When you need help, you ask for help. Just to keep things from being too boring, once in a while you fall down just for a little excitement. <laughs> I am convinced that he contrived to fall down those stairs where Daniel is sitting and gradually got up again, nothing broken. He was a long time skier and knew how to fall. But you knew a tree had come down. <laughs> laugh, laugh a lot. Never, ever give up. Sing while there is breath in your body. I'm still learning. And I'm listening. I think that <clears throat> perhaps now, Harold has gone home to Sheehan, to the forest. And when the wind blows, the wind gets up, and you hear it howling in the tops of the trees, down. Ground level, there is a low. <laughs> and it's Harold. <laughs> or maybe he's in the woods around here. Sometimes I think I hear. The Thursday before Harold died was a very special day. The Hollowell singers sang for him in his room. And afterward, Rebecca called him and he shared these beautiful thoughts. I've been dreaming a lot. For funny situations, I've been trying to get from here to there, point A to point B, and then I've given up and saying, no, you shouldn't be doing that. And I'm in, in situations I should not be in and given up. And gotten back into my current situation during the wake-up process. And it just feels so real. And uh, it's right there in the dream. Uh, and it really connects the two worlds with each other, I think. It's really strange. I've never been uh, in a dangerous situation. Even often, come back to exactly where I was before. Oh, interesting. Yeah. Huh, I bet that's part of the process. I think it is. Yeah. Yeah. And, and to make you feel comfortable with what's coming next. That's right. Wow. Wow, that's, I'm so glad you shared that. That's absolutely fascinating. And generally, the last few years, I have never remembered dreams. No, I do. This dream is telling me that there's nothing to be afraid of because... When this dream becomes real, there are other people to take care of you in that state wow. you were thinking you were in. Yeah. Soon you will be there. Soon, but we don't know exactly when. Something like that. Yes, exactly. I, that makes perfect sense as to what the dream is telling you. So moving over, crossing the bar, so to speak. It, it is teaching us. So unfortunate. Yeah, you are. Having bits and pieces re revealed it to me. I'm so thankful for being aware of what's happening. So many people are not. I know. And I fight it. That's one thing I'll never do. Because there's, there's no way I could win if I try to fight it. And instead I say, I say, thanks for teaching me much better. And teaching me and the rest of us because you're able to talk about it. Yeah. And uh, I hope we can teach all our coming con uh, generations the same thing because there'll be so much
much better off being aware of the processes. Harold Holm started singing when he was in his mid-40s. He was living in Florida at the time and along with his wife Martha discovered a group that sang Norwegian folk songs. She was the singer in the family, the one who had sought this opportunity but offered to Harold, I will do it if you will do it. Apparently it was the enticement he needed because he quickly discovered the joy of singing and that he had a beautiful voice. This was further developed in the choir of the UU Church in Clearwater, Florida. And as we know, his voice was appreciated again at All Souls in Brattleboro, where he and his wife came the very first Sunday after they had moved to Vermont. This was in 1987 at a time when Martha, Martha challenged by Parkinson's disease, attended sporadically, but Harold found his way to church and especially to choir often. It must have felt like a different time those years when they had danced so beautifully together. 
Martha a foot shorter than Harold, but beautifully paired as they demonstrated folk dances and taught others how to do them. Harold remembered years later that he was shy but had learned these dances so that he could teach them. But in order to describe them, he had to first overcome his fear of public speaking, which he did. In his 40s and beyond, he continued to surprise himself with his gifts and abilities. He loved being with the happy Norwegians, sharing with them a heritage that meant so much and continued to define him. He embodied Norway, always found a way to embody Norway in song and dance, in the way he raised his daughter, in the way he moved through and appreciated the world. Vibeka was his little girl, and that is what he called her. He shared with her his love and understanding of nature, his affinity for the natural world. During her high school and college years, they would stay up talking until two or three in the morning, so engrossed and excited by their sharing. And many years later, with Rebecca in California, they continued their frequent and easy conversations by phone when they couldn't have them in person. I was able to glimpse their relationship just last month when Vibeka was here for what was to be the last visit with her father. They both knew it could be that because he spoke freely about death and about his dying. His ability to do so he considered a gift of his Norwegian upbringing. In that honest embrace of the end of his life, father and daughter arrived at All Souls so that Harold could sing with the choir one last time. Rehearsing before the service, Vibeka sat in one of the arranged seats and watched her father with adoring eyes. As he steadied his now gaunt frame with the help of a music stand and stood almost tall, with his fellow choir members. He sang out one more time for his daughter and his church and for this life he loved so much. I'm sure I was not the only one who noticed the beauty and poignancy of that scene, the love between the two of them. She says of him, he was a gorgeous downhill skier. He was one with the mountain flowing down just as the water does, moving with a rhythm that must be the earth's rhythm, belonging to the mountain in the same way the mountain belongs to the world. His theology was that of the Native Americans. He understood the deep sense of belonging to the earth they spoke of, lived with, and learned from. He shared this faith, this profound trust in the earth's wisdom, generosity, and goodness. He loved the words of Chief Seattle because they were what he knew in his heart. The earth does not belong to us. We belong to the earth. Harold understood his place in the world and that understanding enabled his incredible grace. He knew that we are merely strands in this web of life, not the weaver of it. And so deeply he understood that whatever we do to that web, we do to ourselves. For him, this sensibility was the source of both great humility and true belonging. Harold recognized the wisdom of the earth as a wisdom he shared. He saw it in the plants and the animals and the people all around him. He felt it in the mountains he loved and in the wooded hills and fertile valleys, the ones in Vermont. 
and the ones in Norway. He was agile enough to jump from culture to culture. He was agile, Rebecca said, even after one and then another stroke. Of course, he noted, he was no longer the mountain goat he had been, but he still had that hope and that promise. Well, some might call it the hope and promise of an engineer. Others might call it the hope and promise of a mountain goat. There has got to be a better way, he said on more than one occasion, as he adapted to a body that was no longer familiar. And somehow he found once again, he was that mountain goat able to land with grace on an impossibly sheer mountain face. For two years, he did this by living on his own, continuing to find that better way, to find that place that seemed to defy gravity more often than not. His graceful manner was evident again when he moved to Bradley House for assisted living. He often remarked at his good fortune in the form of the river view from his room. His gratitude was readily shared right up until the very end of his life. With an open heart, he spoke of those who cared for him and visited him, of the death that was waiting for him, of the view out the window that would remain, of the daughter he would leave behind and the wife he might meet again. Grace is this openness to life, this willingness to accept and even embrace all aspects, including death. He had opened himself to grace, perhaps from the losses born of Parkinson's and then the death of his wife, perhaps from the loss of his house and his belongings. Now the mountain goat was not just this remembered younger self, filled with grace and poise. It was the aging and physically compromised self, still so ready and able to make the next challenging step. In the precariousness of his situation, he found again and again a footing that seemed impossible. In that mystery that separates this moment from the next, he was able to abide. And death was just one more of these mysteries, one more sheer face he was willing to navigate, one more sheer face he managed with incredible grace. Grace is a palpable openness to the world, an openness to the incredible beauty and pain of life. Grace is the ability to take it all in and the agility to jump from the impossible to the impossible and even make it look easy. Grace is the ability to reassure the ones you love with your certainty in the face of uncertainty, whether on hooves or on skis. Grace is the ability to swoosh down that mountain, to fly even as you fall, to love in the face of hardship, to be grateful in the face of loss, to sing even in your dying days, to spin the love of your life on the dance floor, to spend the wee hours with the daughter who is also your best friend. In his last weeks, he skied down his final slope. Many of us watched him. And as always, it was gorgeous.
so heavy is the long-necked, long-bodied heron. Always it is a surprise when his smoke-colored wings open and he turns from the thick water from the black sticks of the summer pond and slowly rises into the air and is gone. Then not for the first or the last time I take the deep breath of happiness. And I think how unlikely it is that death is a hole in the ground. How improbable that ascension is not possible. Though everything seems so inert, so nailed back into itself. The muskrat and his lumpy lodge, the turtle, the fallen gate. And especially it is wonderful that the summers are long and the ponds so dark and so many. And therefore, it isn't a miracle, but the common thing. This decision, this trailing of the long legs in the water, this opening up the heavy body into new life. See how the sudden gray-blue sheets of his wings drive toward the wind. See how the clasp of nothing takes him in.
Thank you everyone for coming today. The family invites you to stay for the reception. Thank you. 